Jeff, we were talking earlier and you mentioned about 30 years in the field. So you're an encyclopedia almost when it comes to the robotic space. Could you give us a little, just a quick snippet of rundown of the history of robotics and what's kind of stuck out over the time? How, is it, how has it evolved and where we're at now? Yeah, uh, so I started doing what I do, which is executive search and finding talent for robotics and automation companies in 1982. And in 1982, you had a very small number of companies here in the USA that were robotics companies. It was first emerging at that time. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest player at that time that existed was called Unimation, founded by the gentleman who passed away last year, Joseph Engelberger, who's considered the father of robotics. And Unimation was an, a, a huge kind of Neanderthalic product. It was hydraulically driven, and it was used in forging in the uh, Autom automotive industry, Got so it. in hot, um, nasty environments. So the, yeah. really the reason why robotics came into play had to do with the fact that you had people that were in harm's way. So people who are going to be in a hot, nasty, dangerous environment, you put a robot in there that's going to reach into a forge and pull out a piece of metal that's been forged, that's hot, move it out of the way, and you're going to load another ingot in there that's going to get crushed by this machine. So just nasty hard work. That's why robotics existed in the first place. Really? It was to make things easier, of course, and just take those people out of harm's way and put them in another environment where they were going to be out of harm. So that's kind of where it all started, but it was a hy hydraulic solution. That was not an electric motor solution. Nice. So um, Joseph Engelberger at Unimation needed to find an electric robot in order to expand what he was doing. He knew yeah. that he had to have a servo-driven robot. There was a group out in the West Coast that came out of Stanford, and that group um, was uh, a group of students headed by a professor named Victor Scheinemann. So Vic Scheinemann and his team created the first electric robot arm that he named Vicarm or Vicarm, V-I-C-A-R-M. Mm -hmm. He liked to name things after himself. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he created Vicarm, which then was rebranded re Puma, which is an acronym, which I can't remember what P-U-M-A stands for, okay. but it really was the first electric arm that existed. That arm ended up through a series of interesting little twists and turns, which is too long to get into right here, being a product that was um, the, the precursor to ADEPT technology. ADEPT technology um, in uh, the Bay Area is one of the earliest U.S. players that actually um, scaled up a robot product. They had a direct drive, very fast SCARA type arm for assembly that they created. Okay. And the founder of that company were the students that were in Vic Scheinman's um, lab at Stanford. Wow. So that technology rolls out of Stanford. The, the guys at ADEPT end up starting up ADEPT and um, built ADEPT up uh, over the years. And uh, ADEPT sold to Omron last year. So it was a startup that lasted quite a long time before they actually had an event that had them be acquired. So if you go to the Omron booth, you'll see um, Adept Technologies products that have all been rebranded Omron, O-M-R-O-N, yeah. okay? So uh, interestingly enough, the founders of Adept exited Adept in 2004. These are the original founders, the, the uh, technical guys. They started a company called Precise Automation. Precise Automation is also here at the show. They created one of the first cobots. Not a, lot, not a lot of people know this, but this cobot is a machine that can work with human beings and not put them in harm's way. Very small machines applied specifically to the life sciences space. So you'll find Precise Automation's robots, cobots, in the um, in that particular um, vertical. And these guys that are involved in that company, Brian Carlisle is one of the gentleman's name, and uh, Bruce Shimano is the other name. And those were these two guys that were involved very early on as kind of creators of the, uh, the, the technology here in the US. Now, since that time, the technology has advanced and many um, international players have gotten involved. And of course, the, the, the companies that own the robotics industry worldwide tend to be the, either Japanese companies, German companies, Swiss companies, those kinds of folks. Um, people like Fanuc, KUKA, KUKA is German, now owned by the Chinese, incidentally. Um, KUKA is um, the big orange robots you see out there on the show floor. Uh, Fanuc is a Japanese company. They were originally a joint venture between Fanuc out of Japan and General Motors. They were called GMF, or General Motors Fanuc. And then Fanuc bought them out in the late 90s and it became Fanuc 
robotics. So Fanuc has a lot of other big machine tools and other things that they do, but they are a huge player in the industry. Yeah. So, um, you know, kind of rolling back to the last several years, the whole Cobot thing occurred because there was a need in the market, which is recognized by Universal Automation um, out of Denmark, to have a product that would work side by side with people in the space without causing them harm. And in order to do that, they created a machine that had that moved slower, that had built-in force sensing so that it, it, when it came in contact with a person's body, uh -huh. it would stop and not just continue as if they weren't there and hurt them. So yeah. the, the, their, their idea was, we will make that machine be safe and we'll also make it be easily deployable um, in that most robots, the standard industrial robot up till now, each robot company typically had its own robot programming language, mm -hmm. which you would have to learn in order to deploy that robot in an actual working setting. In the Cobot conversation, the goal has been to try to get rid of the programming layer and do it by um, copying moves. In other words, you can physically reach out and move the robot and teach it to move from one point to another and then interact with the um, interface, uh, a tablet, for example, and say, stop here, grip, lift, move. So you, you kind of, each step by step, you can program that robot, and you do it by moving the robot around. So the robot not only has motors that move it around, but also it has encoders that um, will read where it's moving if you're manipulating the robot. So that interaction, um, the theory is that that's going to take away the need to program the robots. Yeah. So really, what's happened is that hasn't eliminated the need for engineering to exist in order to make that robot actually do something functional in the space. You still have to engineer it into a system in order for it to be productive. So yeah. even though you're, you have a cobot, it doesn't mean you don't have any engineering to apply that robot to the specific application. You still have to have that expertise to make that work. That's, uh, and I wouldn't say it's a fallacy about co cobotics, but um, it's not a panacea. It's not like a plug and play idea. Uh, it's really not that simple, but yeah. it's still simpler than buying a machine that requires many, many hours of programming in order to make it work and to apply it. So, you know, from the early days of robotics till now, we've had a resurgence since this last recession, a lot more players in the picture, a lot more interesting things happening, a lot of really cool stuff happening in the mobile robotic space. And mobile robots, in effect, by the way, are cobots. They roll around on the floor, and if they see a human being walk up to them, they stop. So they're compliant, they won't hurt you, they sense your, your presence, and uh, they will move around you. So um, the cobot um, label really, I think, is um, people like Universal Robots and those that are um, producing what they are calling cobots or these machines that are compliant with the specification that says this is what cobots have to be. It's a bigger conversation than simply an arm like the Universal Robot arm. So there, there's more to it than that. And I think ultimately in the future what's going to happen is that cobots will become another product that a robot company offers because cobots can't do it all. Um, the ones that are out there now, they aren't as fast and precise as the very well um, designed, not that cobots aren't well designed, but um, the big deal is being able to have very precise motion down to the micron level. If you're assembling something that's very, very tiny, you, cobots really have a difficult time moving in that minute of a way in order to make that happen. So you still, industrial robots as we know them and as they've been designed are not going anywhere. You're still going to have this uh, classification of machines that are going to exist. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty much what I think. I think in the future you're going to see more people using industrial um, robots and automation. There's an onshoring thing that's happening now where um, we were manufacturing a lot of this technology overseas because it could be done manually because the hourly rates were very low in China and uh, in the Far East. Now they are um, driving their rates up and all of a sudden it's tilting back toward the U.S. It's called reshoring. We're reshoring manufacturing back into the States and the way that's happening is we're applying, applying robotics to those processes in order to make them competitive.